Good morning, happy Monday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand, and it is perfect. Okay, so a lot going on, believe it or not. Hard to believe, you know, with all the constraints on our behaviors of, of late, but uh, the mentorship programs are taking off, so there are people are taking this opportunity to make themselves better, which is really, really cool to see. Um, I'm very, very pleased um, that, that, that people are not sitting back and being the passive recipients of consequences, and they are, they are taking action. And so a lot of people working on themselves, which I think is a very, very powerful thing. So congratulations on that. If you're interested in mentorship, just go to BillHartmanPT.com and check that out, and uh, maybe we'll get to talk, okay? So I got a bunch of questions for the week. Um, but I wanted to start off with, with one from Pete, actually two from Pete. Pete asked a bunch of questions, and, and I hope you don't mind, Pete, but I'm going to paraphrase this stuff a little bit just to make it a little bit more digestible. But basically, uh, Pete's first question is, how are you dissociating sacral movements uh, to pelvic orientations, and how do they show up in testing? So this is actually a really, really good question because it allows us to differentiate the difference between relative motion within the pelvis and then an absolute, absolute orientation of the pelvis. Let me... Let me grab my pelvis for a sec. I'll show you what I mean. So if we're talking about normal stuff here, right? We're gonna talk about normal range of motion first. So if we look at your typical average norms, we get about 60 degrees of hip ER and, and 40 degrees of hip IR by, by dead guy anatomy. So, so what that requires though, is that I have this, this normal nutation, counter nutation element of relative position change in the pelvis. So when I, I am nutated and I have that IR and ilium that allows me to capture my normal IR motion. When I have the counter nutation and the ER and ilium that allows me to capture my ER motion. Now, if I would have measures, let's just say 75 degrees of ER, 25 degrees of, of IR, that still demonstrates the relative motion within the pelvis. It just means that I'm biased towards my inhalation strategies because I've got 70, 75 degrees of ER, what that does is it just means that I've retroverted the, the acetabulum to allow that 75 to show up. If I still have 25 degrees, that means I still have some relative motion here. It's just that I'm biased way back towards my, my inhalation strategy. So keep that in mind. When I have orientations take place, what that means is, is that I'm going to start to lose my physiological motion. So if I would anteriorly orient the, the pelvis, what you're gonna see over time, because of the compressive strategy that takes place on the posterior aspect of the pelvis that, that starts to drive this orientation, is I'm gonna to start to lose my physiological measures. So, so even if I started at 75, 25, as I get pushed forward and I start to anteriorly orient, I'm gonna to start to lose that ER measure because the musculature above the level of the trochanter is compressing the posterior pelvis. It's gonna create this, this orientation and I'm gonna to start to lose my, my ER measure because these muscles reorient, become IRs, and they start to bring myself into that, that hip IR position. So that's a great way to distinguish between uh, the orientations and the relative motions because when I have relative motion of the pelvis, I still have this full physiological range. When I lose my physiological range, then you can pretty much guarantee that I'm, I've got an orientation problem going on. Okay, so Pete's second question had to do with, uh, um, I'm just gonna go to the end of it. Um, what do you commonly refer to when, when you say someone is, is in exhalation versus inhalation? So, so now, Pete, we're gonna talk about the two archetypes. We're gonna talk about your wide ISAs and your narrow ISAs so that everybody just loves to talk about. Um, but in general, what we're looking at is, is different physiological structures. And so if you looked at my Instagram over the weekend, I stood outside one of the, the shops nearby, the, nearby iFest and um, had the Wacky Wavy Tube guy out front. And I just love the Wacky Wavy Tube guy for so many reasons, but one, because it is demonstrative of one of the strategies that we utilize against gravity. So we only have two, we can either expand or we can compress. And so what the two archetypes are representative of is that ability to expand or compress because we will be biased at the extreme. So we're talking about the extremes. We're not talking about anybody that's in the middle range. 
So because of the helical angles, so, so the angles of, 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 if you look at the uh, abdominal muscles, um, that's a great representation of the helical angles, but the ISA is representative of, of those helical angles. So the narrow uh, ISA has a more vertical helical angle. And what that means is that person's physical structure cannot elongate anymore. So their strategy against gravity is to ex try to expand themselves. So they will be inhalation biased based on their physical structure. In the opposing strategy where I have a wide ISA, I can't get any wider, so I try to squeeze myself and compress myself upward against gravity to maintain my position. Well, if one is expanding, then that creates negative pressure, so that's a bias towards inhalation. And if the other's compressing, that's a bias towards exhalation. So that's how we know the difference between these two archetypes is one is a compressor and one is an expander. So the, the compressor is an exhalation bias and the expander is the inhalation bias. The ISA represents the compensatory strategy against their axial skeletal bias that we just discussed. And so that's what allows me to determine what their strategy may be against gravity. So when we talk about inhalation or exhalation, it's based on your physical structures. So I hope that clarifies that for you, Pete. I hope everybody has a fabulous Monday. I got stuff to do, including finishing up my neuro coffee which is delicious as usual. Everybody have a great day and I'll see you later.